All right, today our theme for Global Contemporary is Confronting Race. We're talking about three artworks from our Global Contemporary unit that deal with um, race, people of color. Um, all three of these artists are Black um, American artists. Um, and we are going to look at how their work um, confronts race, talks about race, um, breaks down kind of barriers and stereotypes relating to um, race. So first we are going to start with Horn Players by Jean-Michel Basquiat, painted in 1983 acrylic and foil paint stick on three canvas panels. So here is that work. I'm going to give you a couple seconds just to look at this work. Um, it's very different from some of the other works that we've looked at so far in our Global Contemporary Unit. It has a lot of components going on in the three different panels and is pretty interesting. Okay, so Basquiat was an artist um, in the 80s. Um, he started out his life as a graffiti artist, um, and I definitely think that we can see that influence here in kind of the playfulness, uh, the messiness almost of the way that some of the words are... Um, like they don't quite fit into the panel and they look like just normal handwriting. Um, so he started um, painting street art in New York City um, and he would do graffiti artists and he would sign um, his graffiti with the tag S-A-M-O, which um, stands for it's this kind of, it's not like an acronym, but it's just like SAMO. It's like same old um, fill in the blank with a four letter word that starts with S. Um, so SAMO. Um, and they remained anonymous for a very long time in the late 70s. Um, they, with their graffiti art, strategically would target art galleries um, as a criticism of the commercial art world. Um, he was a self-taught artist. He was Haitian American and Puerto Rican. Um, and he takes a lot of his ideas from literature and books. We're going to watch this interview with Basquiat. Um, here we go. Jean-Michel Basquiat arrived on the New York art scene in 1979, and when he died, tragically of a drug overdose in the summer of 1988, he had become an international art superstar. Basquiat, along with Schnabel, Herring, Sally, and others, was one of a whole new generation of painters, young, bright, and irreverent. And when the New York Times wrote about these new artists in 1985, it was his picture they chose for the cover of their Sunday magazine. After much coaxing, Jean-Michel reluctantly agreed to let Art New York interview him in the spring of 1983 in his loft on Crosby Street. Shot in a verite style, this interview captures his spontaneous, playful nature often seen in his work. Where do the, the words come from? Uh, it, um, real life books, real television. Yeah, and you, you just skim them and uh, start including... No, man, certain, I'm, when I'm working here, I hear them, you know, and I just throw them down. Oh, yeah? Well, I mean, things like Punic Wars, I remember that was in one of your... Oh, th th that was from a, a, a guidebook on Roman history. And uh, you, you had been uh, reading it and... Uh... Well, it, it, was not, it wasn't that long, that actual history part of it. It's like, you know, history of Roman, five pages, you know? Yeah.
he put out all the best he could give to the world in his paintings and all his ideas. He was so ready to give it to everybody. He was extremely generous as a person as an, and, as a, and as an artist. It was one thing he was definitely serious about. It was making art, you know? Jean-Michel lived his life like a fire. Burned really hot, really bright. The fire went out, but the coals are still hot. Okay, we are going to stop there. So, um, that interview was interesting, not only because you got to see Basquiat talking about his work, but you got to see him talking about some of his ideas. So, the interviewer was asking him, you know, where do these words come from? Um, Basquiat is famous for this kind of juxtaposition of imagery and words. Um, and even though... Basquiat's artwork can see can seem very um, uneducated and maybe spontaneous and messy and sloppy um, and uninformed. It is very informed and sophisticated on a lot of levels, and I think that this painting here is a really good example of that. Um, so he would take words and ideas and concepts from books that he was reading like he said in that video he takes a lot of ideas from literature he would often appropriate the works of Manet and Picasso um, and use their artworks um, insert them into his artworks um, and he would kind of take all of these things, all of these historical things, and use them in his artworks. So this here is horn players, um, and maybe when you were looking at this earlier, you saw some musical instruments in it. So this is a tribute to several different jazz musicians. Um, so thinking about this as kind of this idea or concept of a visual representation of music or jazz, we have um, jazz being this kind of musical form that's improv, right? It's all spontaneous, it's all improvised. Um, so the way that Basquiat is depicting that here in his artwork is he's writing words over and over again, crossing them out purposely misspelling some words um, we have this like rhythm that's created by the repetition we have the rhythm that's created from left to right with these figures um, the text and the imagery just kind of make it more dynamic um, and um, different um, it has this kind of discord almost rather than this harmony Um, and he's using his text and imagery to kind of elaborate on this theme of, oops, how did I do that, of jazz music. So, like I said, this is a tribute to several different jazz, or jazz musicians. So, we have Charlie Parker, um, and I'm trying to figure out which one is Charlie Parker. Um, oh, I believe it's this guy. We can see his name back here behind this kind of painted over strip repeated over and over and over again, Charlie Parker. Um, he was a saxophone player who changed the course of modern jazz and co-founded what's called the bebop movement. Um, and he was a African-American musician. So this kind of celebration of um, African-American musicians and also jazz music being this very kind of black art form in the celebration if we think back to kind of our jacob lawrence piece and we get to the harlem renaissance is this celebration of black culture this is kind of almost in that same thread so we have charlie parker here um and then charlie parker is married his wife um he called her chan and this is like a little scavenger hunt to figure out where we have chan written on here. I hope you can find it before I can. 
Oh, I don't see it on there. Um, so he was married to Chan, and their daughter's name was Pri, and I know where that is. I just found it. So Pri is right here. So this is the name of Charlie Parker's daughter. Um, and then we also have, um, I believe over here, this is Dizzy Gillespie. Um, and he was known for his, um, scat, which is this like wordless improvisation, um, of just like eat boxing, um, like this rhythm with no words. I don't know how to explain that better. Um, so we have Charlie Parker, saxophone player over here. I was wrong. This is Charlie Parker. And then we have Dizzy Gillespie. Um, and I believe this is Dizzy Gillespie over here. So other words that we have kind of repeated throughout here, we have ornithology, which you may have thought was kind of weird. That's the study of birds, but that was the name of a song by Charlie Parker. Um, so he's using kind of Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, pre names of these artists, um, this kind of very improvised style to visually represent jazz. Repeating things, being spontaneous. Here are some of his other artworks. These kind of skull-like depictions are very common in Basquiat's artwork. Um, we can see a little bird here, lots of layers. Um, this, um, I don't remember what this piece is called. I think it's untitled, which is just so silly to me sometimes. Um, this one sold for something like $110 million recently, which is like equivalent to Picasso's and other big names like that. Basquiat's style in general reminds us very much of expressionism. We have our expressionism, our abstract expressionism, we have our German expressionism, this kind of like really loose painterly style where we're using the like physicality of our paint to depict ideas and emotions um, rather than working on representing things like truly realistically. It's more about what can our art Say, what ideas can we say which are which is a pretty big idea with global contemporary artists so um, I guess I just want to leave you with a quote from Basquiat for you to just kind of chew on so Basquiat said at one point I am NOT a black artist I am an artist so what does that mean for um, black artists in the global contemporary world. Can they be just artists? Do their artwork have to be about the black experience or ideas or race? Can they just be artists? That's not a question that I have an answer to, but just something for you to kind of think about. Okay, we are going to switch to our next work, 243. Darky Time Rebellion by Kara Walker, 2001, Cut Paper and Projection on Wall. 2001, some of you may have actually been alive when this one was made. Um, I'm doing the quick math in my head. We're, we're cutting it a little bit close on that one. Um, but this is a very interesting piece. This is um, Darky Town Rebellion. Kara Walker is a um, global contemporary artist who works with silhouettes and does a lot of installations. So artworks created specifically for gallery spaces. So Kara Walker began her career as a painter um, and she's best known for these cut paper silhouettes, um, which she creates by drawing the images on black pieces of paper, cutting them out and then adhering them to surfaces. And her the goal of her work is to elicit from the viewer an uncomfortable and very emotional reaction. So 
we are just going to do some looking at Darky Town Rebellion from different angles. Um, unfortunately, this is these are all photographs and it would be different to experience this in real life, but we're going to do our best. So here is what it looks like from our um, attribution. We know that it's cut paper, so this part here is all paper. And then we have an old school overhead projector, um, which she's using to project the color on the walls. Here is a different view of it. I want for you to just start looking more closely at all the individual figures and what they're doing and who they might be. Here's another close up of the right wall. Maybe you're starting to feel uncomfortable or unsure. You just have more and more questions popping up in your head. Here's the right side. Okay, we're gonna let Kara Walker talk a little bit about her work and then we will finish up. about the unexpected kind of wanting to be the heroine and yet wanting to kill the heroine at the same time and that kind of dilemma that push and pull is the underlying turbulence that I bring to each of the pieces that I make The silhouette lends itself to, you know, avoidance of the subject, you know, not being able to look at it directly. Okay, so Kara Walker and the silhouette. So let's talk about where she gets some of her ideas from. So Kara Walker um, takes imagery um, from literature and accounts of um, antebellum American South. So that is the American South before the Civil War. Um, she looks to history to find visual representations of black people, of the horrors of slavery in antebellum or in the antebellum South. Um, and she uses this imagery in her art as a way to engage with and challenge race within our current contemporary culture. So silhouettes, um, silhouettes, let's go to some closer ones, um, were a very, very popular craft in um, antebellum America. Um, it was a really easy way to get like a portrait taken. All you would have to do is just have like some sort of light source projection. Um, I remember doing this in like pioneer day in fourth grade. Um, you would just like have someone shine a light on you and then they would behind you trace kind of your profile, your silhouette onto a piece of black paper and then cut it out. Um, and this was very popular among the upper class for portraits. Um, but silhouettes were deemed women's crafts um, and never became really fully part of the art scene. Um, so silhouettes themselves have a very interesting history. So when we talk about visual depictions of people of color, of African Americans, black people, we have to talk about historically what we've seen so far. So I want for you just think for your a second of um, what College Board has given us so far as far as depictions of people of color. Are you drawing a blank? Um, you probably are because like honestly we have not seen um, any depictions of 
black people outside of our Africa unit. Um, and that is not College Board's fault, I don't think. Maybe I should take that back. Um, but in general, throughout history, people of color have been not included visually. They have been um, left out. If we think about the, mu- or the artworks that hang in museums, it's often European, American, this kind of Western style of art that focuses very much on the elite, rich, upper class, white people. Um, and so when we talk about um, depictions of black people, we do have to acknowledge that they have often been dis included i don't know if that's a word but i'm going to use it Um, and when they have been included it's often been through um stereotypes or depictions of them as slaves or primitive or lesser i have some examples of these things to show you um so one of the artworks that we have in our image set is slave ship um and this is our Turner piece and we know that we have a slave ship that has thrown overboard their um, suffering slaves so that way they can claim insurance money for them. This illustration over here is of a slave ship um, of how they would um, pack people into this ship um, so that way they could transport them across the Atlantic Ocean and then sell them in the Americas. Other depictions of black people that we often see throughout history are either stereotypes like these Aunt Jemima figures who are seen as these kind of happy and jovial, um, simple women. Um, They're characters, they're not true people, they are um, stereotypes of this kind of idea of a black woman. We have also had white people um, dress up as black people in what's known as blackface. Um, All of these things are embarrassing and they're despicable. Um, And historically, um, just really problematic. So when we look at this kind of confrontation of race, um, race can be like a really difficult thing to talk about, but some of our artists are kind of challenging us and giving us this new language and new lens for um, art made by and made for African American people. So thinking about these being kind of the historical depictions that we have of black people. Kara Walker in her Darky Town Rebellion goes back to those ideas of stereotypes and violence in her artworks. So the use of silhouettes allowed Kara Walker to, um, oh, I lost my place on my notes, to show those racial stereotypes that reduce people, um, like how a silhouette reduces a figure to just an outline, right? It's the simplification of someone who is much more complex than just this outline, just like how black people are much more complex than stereotypes and um, racial characters of them. The silhouettes also create this kind of um, aspect of being anonymous, right? We can see outlines, but we can't see necessarily who all these people are. So we're simplifying, but we're also making people more anonymous. Um, And by making these black silhouettes on a white background, she's literally contrasting black and white as a symbol of racial tensions. So, Darky Town Rebellion itself um, forces the viewer to be in the physical same place as the scene. You can walk up to it, you can get close to it. As you walk into this gallery and you walk closer to it, the colored projection from the wall would um, be cast upon you, so you become physically a part of this work. Um, And what Kara Walker is asking us to do as a viewer is to think about how we perceive visually people. 
So you walk into this gallery, you see these people on the wall, they're just black silhouettes. Um, and when we look at them, she wants us to think, you know, who do we think these people are based on our preconceived notions of what people of certain races look like? Are these people black? Are these people white? What stereotypes of, you know, facial features, facial proportions do we already have embedded in our brains just from culture and society? And how do we use that to visually interpret the world around us? And so we are confronting our own kind of preconceptions about what black people look like, what white people look like. And then we are also, the second layer of this is kind of the very nightmarish imagery that we have happening here. Like we have very strange and very almost surreal like imagery like there's this lady here um, and she's almost on like this mast of the sail and then we have this man here who has this very kind of like colonial looking like um, suit coat tail and then there's these small young boys here who are kind of like running towards him and there's this figure who's up here just kind of like floating in the sky there's this really ambiguous scene down here where we see a figure most likely a female with a child on her back and we can't quite figure out what's happening down here and then over on the left is when things start to get really kind of nightmarish and violent looking we have this figure here we have this almost like animal hybrid human here, um, another human figure here, there's someone here and we can tell that he is missing a leg. And then we have this female figure here wearing kind of a very colonial like hoop skirt. Um, but there's, she's like holding this big staff and it looks like she may have been like murdering or harming some sort of figure down here while there's this baby playing in the background um so it's very nightmarish and um uncomfortable and it doesn't make sense right um despite how much is shown here we still don't know age gender race and so it's asking us to confront like who would these people be? Why are they doing these things? Are these, is this a man? Is this a woman? Is this a child? Is it an adult? Is this person white? Is this black? Um, and she's taking this kind of imagery from before the Civil War era. So think slavery, think owning people, um, think violence against black people and using them here in her contemporary artworks. Um, this piece was inspired by an anonymous landscape that was titled Darky Town, um, which depicted caricatures of African Americans. So African Americans depicted in very stereotyped ways like we see here. And so by looking at these very violent images of things that are supposed to be of this time period that was hundreds of years ago for us, Kara Walker is asking us as a viewer, um, are the caricature images from the original Darky Town Rebellion something from the past or are those stereotypes and racism still true and relevant today? And I think that we could answer very strongly yes to that. So she, through her work, wants to um, show us that this is not something that we can leave in our past. This is something that we still need to address and confront today. We still need to work through these ideas of racism, hatred, violence, stereotype, etc. Here are two of her other works. This one is in the Indianapolis Art Museum. 
Um, also, a silhouette also has that kind of air of unusual nightmarish violence where this lady is like holding her own decapitated head. And if you look a little bit closer, can you guys tell what those cutouts are on her skirt? Those are um, little cotton buds. So going back to um, slavery in the South, picking cotton. Here are some more silhouettes arranged on a wall. So Kara Walker is a very interesting artist. A lot of really deep and heavy concepts in her artworks. It makes us uncomfortable. It asks us questions. We know that global contemporary artwork is all about questions, ideas, concepts. So we're going to move on to our next artwork, Dancing in the Louvre, um, from the series The French Collection Part 1. This is 232 by Faith Ringgold. Painted in 1991, acrylic on canvas, tie-dyed, pieced fabric border. Um, so Faith Ringgold is a contemporary artist who does what she calls story quilts. So this is a very kind of new art form for us. We have not looked at a lot of textile work in our 250. Um, and her artworks are just very interesting. We're going to watch this video of her talking about why she chooses this medium for her artworks. In 1970, part of what lots of women artists were doing was trying to find out what makes women's art different. From men's. I mean, what is this women's art? Well, in the 60s, it was, what is this black art? Why is black art different from anybody else's? Why do you have to have any special recognition because you're black? What is there about your art that makes it different? So now with the women's movement, it was, you know, what is this about your art as a woman that makes it different? So a lot of women were thinking about that. The subject matter, the materials, what is it, you know? So clearly, there are certain art forms that have traditionally been women's art forms. And one of them has been quilt making, working with cloth, weaving all kinds of uh, needlework, needlework. And um, here I have, a, a, as many people do, a family that uh, sewed and made quilts. So we have got it in my family. So maybe I have suppressed through the years, this recognition that all of these things are part, could be part of my art. Since I've always taught them, long before I did them in my work, I was teaching them. So what's that about, you know? So I got an opportunity to um, be in an exhibition called The Artist and the Quilt in 1980. And uh, my mother uh, told me that she would help me to make this first quilt. And we made it together, collaboration. And just one experience of doing that just sold me. It was such a wonderful experience. Why, why was it wonderful? Well, it's the, the idea of, um, first of all, of combining uh, the influence that I've had for of European painters, Picasso, Matisse, you know, Monet, all those guys that they taught me at, to paint like at UCSD when I thought I could do the flowers and all. Um, to be able to combine that with quilt making from my great great grandma Susie, you know, which was in many ways a slave experience, an art form that slave women used uh, to um, embellish and beautify useful objects such as um, uh, quilts. Because the African American experience with quilt making was <clears throat> very much like the African who uh, made the tools roughly and then 
and then adorned them and made them skillfully so that things became were useful but then they were beautified so here's something we're going to sew some cloth together to cover ourselves because we want to keep warm and now we're going to beautify those pieces that we sew together and uh, make them into quilts and so now it's a it's an art piece and it's useful so i would Okay, um, I want to cut it off there because I don't want to go too long today. Um, but Faith Ringgold talked about how um, her art is um, story quilts. This very traditionally feminine thing of textile work, fabrics, is always something that we associate with kind of women and crafts. Um, and it also being this very traditionally um, black art form, right? This idea that it was something that came from the, like, historical time period of slavery, um, that they kind of would sew together scraps of, um, cloths to make quilts and then also to make clothing. This thing that is very, a representation of who she is as a person, right? She's a black female artist, um, and she is known for highlighting biases or biases, um, racism, sexism in our kind of socially accepted art, like we see here in the Louvre, right? This is our classical, it's our Western art. Um, and she offers through her art this kind of alternative to the European, the masculine perspectives that are so prevalent in art history, as we learned with our Kara Walker piece. So she was an artist in the 1960s, starting out, um, and she was a leader in protest movements that would go to museums, um, and they would protest for inclusion of female artists, of artists of color, um, she was part of the women's art movement, so like that video said, she very much kind of, um, was in, not only considered a black artist, but also a feminist artist. And she said at one point, you can't stand around waiting for someone to say who you are. You have to write it, paint it, and do it. So this idea of, you know putting out your own identity, being who you are, writing your own history, painting your own history. So here in Dancing um, at the Louvre, we have Faith Ringgold kind of painting a history. It's not a real story, it's a fictional story, but on this story quilt, we have the story of um, the adventures of Willa Marie Simone. So this artwork is part of what she calls the French collection and it is um, 12 story quilts that illustrate so they depict and they also narrate. You can see up here at the top we have um, text and words, um, the adventures of this 16 year old black girl. So she, um, this fictional character, Willa Marie Simone, um, left Georgia in the United States to go model in Paris. And Willa is this kind of representation of Faith Ringgold's own mother, who was a fashion designer and a dressmaker, um, and very much where Faith Ringgold learned how to sew and how to quilt. She got that from her mother. Um, so Willa is this kind of representation of Ringgold's own mother and then also Josephine Baker who was a famous black dancer. Um, and in the French collection and the different artworks that we have from this series, she, Willa encounters Picasso, Matisse, and other famous artists in Paris um, and she eventually becomes a businesswoman and an artist. So dancing at the Louvre specifically, um, uses this narrative format to um, literally rewrite history. Um, we have this family of black women in the Louvre dancing around. 
right? They could be looking at the Mona Lisa's. These are all Da Vinci paintings here in the background. Um, but they are kind of celebrating and they are dancing, which we would not see in a museum, right? If you kind of picture going into a museum, everyone's like very quiet. Maybe they're like whispering to each other and they're walking slowly. But these women are being like jubilant. They're dancing, they're playing, they're laughing. Um, and so this is kind of um, this very interesting juxtaposition. We have these black women in this world dominated by kind of white people, white traditions, European traditions, male artists. Um, and they are just dancing around, right? They are themselves their own kind of art. It very much reminds me of um, Beyonce and Jay-Z's music video, which I believe I've showed you guys. Um, and so Faith Ringgold, through this artwork, is kind of not accepting, you know, that idea of, you know, what is Western is right. Um, she is including these black women. She's commenting on Western art. In that video, she talked about how she, you know, started out as an artist learning in the Western style of Da Vinci and Picasso and doing master studies and things like that. And so she's using this very traditionally like feminine craft media, but on top of it, she's still painting um, in kind of her faith wrinkled style, but still these paintings in the background kind of have that um, modeling, they have that three dimensionality a little bit. And so by including these women here, um, she's, Lastly, just commenting on how while they can go to this museum, they are not visually represented represented in this museum, right? It They are discluded when they are included. It's stereotyped. It's marginalized, like we talked about with Kara Walker. Here are some of her other artworks. Um, this one is called Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima? So Faith Ringgold takes that stereotyped image of Aunt Jemima and she gives her a new narrative. She becomes this like entrepreneur and businesswoman and just really wonderful lady through kind of this story here. Um, we have some artworks that do more with kind of the race riots in the 60s, um, the violence against black people. Here's two more artworks from Faith Ringgold. We have um, I don't know if this is one of the French collection series, but I don't, um, I don't remember. But we have these um, black ladies here in this field, and they're creating this sunflower quilt. And if we look a little bit closer, we have Mr. Van Gogh here in the background. So this idea of these black women as artists in the same thread, literally and figuratively, as Van Gogh. And then this piece over here um, reminded me of our Basquiat that we talked about with our jazz musicians, um, that kind of celebration. It just felt very jubilant. So that's Faith Ringgold. Um, my art history challenge for you guys today is I have three artists on here, three other contemporary black artists who deal with kind of representation and depiction of um, black people, the black experience, and I would love for you to just go and you could look them up on Instagram. They all have Instagrams. You could go read an article about them, watch a YouTube video. Um, this is Kahunde Wiley. Um, this one here is Amy Sherald. She said, I am painting the paintings I want to see in museums and I'm hopefully presenting them in a way that's universal enough that they become representative of something different than just a black body on canvas. And this is Titus Kapar, um, and he takes paintings from history and will repaint them entirely and then often um, paint over them in this way. And he has a really phenomenal TED talk called Can Art Amend History? So my art history challenge for you is, oops, um, dig deeper, research more, learn more, enjoy. Bye.